lucky because she was making a trip out to L.A. and uh, she got a chance to actually have lunch with Sue and to talk about uh, her part and what Sue felt during these years. And I was very, very fortunate because she and Donnie, who played young, young Sting, and Liz Byler is her name, Liz who played young Sue, their chemistry was really good on the screen. And they actually knew each other five minutes before I threw them in front of the camera. So Liz does an extraordinary acting job and really gives me the feel uh, for what Sue Borden went through in these early years. She was an optimistic uh, young lady who believed in her husband, even though he was in this really crazy profession called professional wrestling. Now the second unit shot this shot, and it was shot down by the wake not too far from my house. And uh, there were a lot of cars that you can't see in the background stopping, and there were people that wanted to come down and uh, take pictures of the wedding, and there were people honking. Fortunately, we didn't need sound here, or it would be a different sounding movie. Every movie has to have a, a Hawaiian shirt someplace in it. Okay, now, when Sue and Steve actually got married, uh, they went to an apartment that had absolutely nothing in it. I mean, all Steve had was a blanket on the floor and a clock radio. And I think he said he had a fork and a towel he had gotten from either the Holiday Inn or some other hotel that had graciously lent him a towel, unbeknownst to them. And uh, when I showed him all these candles, he said, I wish I had thought of that. Because where he brought Sue was to a, just a totally bare house uh, with nothing in it. And uh, finally, I guess a, a month or two after uh, they lived in this house, they got to go to Mr. Steve's, that was the actual name, Mr. Steve's Furniture Place, and rent furniture while well, they were kids. And, you know, the first thing they rented was a television. I had Sue convinced that wrestling was going to put us into the big... Sue actually didn't have any clothes with her and uh, just what she brought in her suitcase. And one of the wrestling wives had a little habit of borrowing stuff from J.C. Penney's She'd go in and actually write down, mark down the price, and then pay the mark down price she put with a red pen. And uh, so when Sue walked into this neighbor's apartment, what she found were all these new clothes that actually had the tags on them. And because this lady's weight went up and down, she was able to borrow clothes in her own size. So when they lived in Alexandria, Indiana, Sue looked real good every time she went out. Thank you, J.C. Penny. Tell you something funny about that scene that you just saw. He became the ultimate warrior, and I became. The I made him smooch for like 20 minutes. They did. That was the first time they saw each other, and so the first couple of times we did that, uh, they were very stiff. Till finally, I just walked in and said, "Donnie, make out with this girl," and she did, and he did, and we got real, and uh, it turned out great. I love this backstage stuff. Uh, this is Hammerjack. Look at that tattoo. What an opportunity for Hammerjack. That's right. The opportunity comes to me because he couldn't show up. Terry Taylor, thank you very much. Sting, the pretty boy from California. Let me tell you, I'm going to beat your eyes out, send him to the back of the room so you can see me pin your lifeless body right in the middle of the ring. Let me give you a little advice. You can't turn your back on a man like me, Hammerjack. How sensitive. Hammerjack, listen to me. The only thing you're going to hear in the ring is snap. Okay, now Donnie had to do this like 10 times. And Steve is over to the left, the real Sting. Here's Donnie looking exactly like the real Sting did when he was this age. And Donnie, who's this nice, gentle guitar player, had to really work hard at, uh, at uh, becoming this wild man wrestler. But he got it. And when he slides into the ring now uh, for this singles match, he suddenly has become Sting. The second unit photographer, uh, Andy King, is playing the referee in this uh, particular uh, scene. Okay, now watch this move coming up. Donnie gets thrown down and he snaps himself right back off the floor. Boom! Okay, now watch. He kicks up. See that kick? If I did that, I would, I would break my hip.
If you, if you look over on the uh, behind the scenes, you'll see Steve teaching Donnie how to do the scorpion death lock because that's what that thing was. Because we rented one of our rooms out to a wrestler named the Angel of Death. I love this name, Angel of Death. I mean, credit cards just to get by. Very, very creative. I remember the night Sue and I were driving back. We were coming across Interstate 10, heading west. And I looked at my young, beautiful bride and said, let's just keep on going. If we keep going, we'll be home in three days. I really lucked out because I found some footage of the time, which was uh, late 80s, where there were lots of cars of that, uh, of that time uh, on the highway. So that was kind of a B-roll shot. OK, this is where uh, young Sting comes to the end of himself, and he calls on God to help him out. And uh, this is the hardest scene to shoot, because for Steve, whose life story we're telling, this had to be absolutely right, because this was his turning point as far as his career really getting started. It was after he called on God that things really started to happen. Help. And uh, Donnie pulls it off. The scene was a lot longer, we edited it down so that we feel his desperation and we let he and Liz interact. And it turns out to be this sweet moment. I'm desperate. This house we rented, you saw the garage earlier with, with uh, um, young Carson. You know my brother Jeff? Petrus in it. And uh, right? right in front of the garage is this little house. And uh, a guy named Eddie allowed us to rent this house for 200 bucks for the day. And so we used this living room for the candle shot. And then the kitchen is actually, uh, in the movie, is another location. The candles were an apartment. This is actually their house in Texas. So the house worked out really good, and we were able to shoot a lot of stuff in one day. God, please help. Honey, I hit the jackpot mining your clothes. Ten bucks. Liz does a nice job here. We voted on this soft lighting because we wanted we wanted it to feel like you're actually at home, like you weren't in a, on a set. And the truth of the matter is, you weren't on a set. You were actually at Eddie's house. God, which is a call I never made before. Seemed like the only option. What There's some more smooching here. God does hear prayers now, I'm going to tell you something that I'm not supposed to tell you as the director, but these guys are in the wrong costume. When they left the kitchen, they were in one costume, and then we went down the street and they made a costume change, and it was actually my screw up. Uh, but it was pretty and it, it gave action. I decided to put it in, hoping that you wouldn't notice. They advertised their grand openings and I appeared for them. They said my name. Okay, we shot that exterior at Hardy's. And Donnie did a good job holding up the Hardy sign. And then they were redoing the inside of the restaurant, so we really couldn't get in there. And uh, this lady here, by the way, is our uh, catering lady who helped us out. And this was the boom guy. And we actually made this scene up on the spot. My uh, partner and one of the co-producers, Rob Veneri, and Steve Borden are over playing ping pong right beside this set. We had to make them shut down while we did this, while they were in the middle of their big match. Anyway, we couldn't use the inside of Hardy's, so we ended up using uh, the ping pong room at the People's Church of Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, it approximated the, uh, the front of Hardy's really well. We brought in the balloons and put up the grand opening sign, and I think it looks real good. One of the things that makes the movie work is the, uh, he's wrestling with uh, Ric Flair. Ric was a great champion and is a great champion. and. Uh, He's a guy that really knows his business. And this is the night when the league decided that they were gonna let Steve move up. And uh, he wrestles Ric Flair, and to everybody's amazement, he goes through the crowd and Ric decides, because he's the guy that held the ball, he decides to let Steve have his big day. And, become, and that's the wrestling business. Okay, we shot this, and this is a cool story. Uh, the way Kathy, my wife, actually got introduced to Steve to become her manager was through this guy right here named Simeon Nix. And uh, Simeon is actually about six foot six, you know, 275 pounds, a guy you can't say no to very easily. But this is a reenactment of a scene that actually happened. Uh, 
1995 when Sting was on the road. And Simeon actually asked Sting, let me ask you something. Steve. If that plane goes down, do you know where you'll spend eternity? If the plane goes down, where will you spend eternity? And that was one of those things that stuck in Steve's head and really was a, a turning point in his thinking process about who God was and how he related to him. But uh, I think Donnie does a great job here of looking around the room because in real life, Steve just wanted this moment to be over when he was living it because he was afraid the other wrestlers would come in and see him. Punch him right in the mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So there I sat on the plane and actually for the first time in my life thinking, Okay, Stan had some great cloud footage here, and uh, it really worked. This wasn't in the original script, but that cloud footage there really worked. How much time do I have? Okay, now Matthew and uh, Sting say goodbye to each other. And uh, this is a real sweet ending. I'll let you listen to it. Thank you. You're a real interesting person. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> I love it how their relationship developed. And from being so stiff, they end up actually being casual friends at the end of it. See this shot right here? We lucked out. The sun was setting, it was in the back of the studio, and somebody cracked open the garage door, and when we saw the sun, we went, man, that looks great, let's go shoot it. A lot of movies have those moments that you don't know about when uh, you just kind of let it happen. Uh, Steve comes out to do this big match, and this is the, the thing that wrestling fans love. We let this match go on. This is like an old-fashioned, big-time match. Uh, we don't cut it up, we just let it play. And uh, these two guys really, really, really go at it. Um, this, this wrestler uh, is a guy that's about six foot seven, I would say, and his name is Chris Justice. And uh, Chris uh, is a really amazing athlete. Look at him throwing Steve over there. I mean, he's amazing. Now. What comes up here is something that almost stopped the movie. They do a move where Sting gets thrown around and smashed to the mat, a move that he's done many, many times. But what happened when they did it this time is that they missed and Steve got knocked out. I mean, he was knocked cold. And I thought, oh my gosh, the movie's over. Uh, and uh, when you begin to look at this, the way we shot it, Lou did a great job, Lou Shinatri, our director of photography, did a great job of letting you feel, even though there's choreography here, that this, uh, this athleticism is amazing. And these guys really work hard at putting on a great show. Okay, the move is coming up here. Here it comes. Bang, right there, Steve gets, oh, he's, he's not cold, you're looking at it. He is not playing, he's out. We had to stop filming and I thought the movie was over. But he got up, decided he didn't have a concussion, or at least the concussion wasn't all that bad. And uh, we went back to work. And he did this move right here, which, oh, I could hear my chiropractor saying, what are you doing? Anyway, these two guys did a great job. And uh, this match was really fun to shoot. And then we rolled in footage from other places uh, that, uh, took you out of the studio and made it real. The guy singing in the background is Michael Sweet. And Michael was part of the band Striper, uh, the big hair band from uh, the late 80s and early 90s. OK, that's an actual chair, folks. There's nothing fake about that chair. When Steve gets hit with the chair, He's actually getting hit. Made everybody in the room wince. You know, you forget that the referee plays a big part in these matches. And David Engler, who plays the referee here, does a great job because he just re his job is to react to things and to control the ring. But he really reacts the way the public reacts. He jumps. Over, see him, oh, see him, see him respond to uh, the licks there. I found out that being a ref in wrestling has its own art. Watch this fly. Bang! 
Now remember, Steve is six foot four coming off that top rope. I love this girl here, she has no teeth. This is another Ashley Cleveland song. And uh, it really tells the story as we begin to see behind the scenes what's happening in Steve's soul as uh, we discover that he's hooked on alcohol and pills. Because you know when you fly off that top rope and you hit the, the concrete outside the ring or you uh, smash into the turnbuckle, that's not fake, that's real. These guys take a lot of beating. Their bodies get really beat up. And uh, for a lot of them, uh, painkillers and booze become their alternative to the pain they feel every day. You gotta sleep tonight, big boy. Okay, now we start seeing the big stars. This is Randy Savage, and he was a huge star in professional wrestling, a world champion. And uh, he and Steve had a lot of big matches together. I think they might have even worked as a tag team. I'm in Dallas Page, and uh, Diamond was a champion, and he and Steve wrestled for the champion. The Turner Networks into big money places because this is when Ted Turner. We wanted to show the loneliness of uh, the moments when you're not in the ring. And so we picked this uh, garage. This is actually under the Municipal Auditorium in Nashville. And uh, we picked uh, an actor named Lowell Perry because Lowell just had a matter of fact kind of attitude. And Lowell plays the guy who actually owns in the backstory, owns the auditorium where Steve is wrestling. And uh, a lot of these lines are actually lines f from my dad. When I wrote this, I was thinking about my dad because my dad is, was a guy who would just introduce himself to anybody and just start a conversation. And uh, Lowell kind of reminds me of my dad and his kind of uh, oh, laissez-faire, how you doing attitude where he didn't know any strangers. He is wonderful. I got two boys. Two little boys. Yeah. How long have you been riding a Harley? I bought it a couple years. Steve really starts to open up here, show his vulnerability. And Steve owns a Harley in real life. And uh, so writing this in was just a natural part of the movie. Good transitional piece. Very good transitional piece. You start introducing the idea of God's chasing Steve now. Uh, Lowell says to Steve, hey man, and uh, Lowell's name in the script is Jonathan. And he says, hey, you can go back in. There's church tomorrow. And Steve looks at him, it's kind of like church. You know, this guy's a maniac. No, 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 I'm not going. You guys party your little hearts out tonight, I'm not going. Yes, I mean it. I'll see you guys in San Antonio. See ya. <laughs> yeah, man, I used to be a party boy. It gets inside your head sometimes. Nick and Phil did a really good job of making the sound work. We're down this, um, this, echoey garage yeah, so to pull the sound out we didn't hey, we didn't do any overdubs here this is actually the sound that was happening down here Nick Palladino and uh, Phil Gazelle did a great job of uh, really designing the sound for the movie because we were in so many different places I'm really sorry I didn't get the reverse of this guy he was a great drunk coming out of the top of the car and uh, he uh, he did a, a really, really uh, good job. His name is James Cox, and he is actually a wrestler. Okay, Steve goes in the room, and uh, what you don't see is the photographer is actually standing up on the bed trying to get this shot. And uh, we've got two cameras working, and Steve comes in, and we just wanted to show you that, uh, you know, even though you're in front of millions and millions of people on television, you still have to go back to your room 
and uh, face the demons. And you got to dry out your gear. For the wrestling guy, there's no little maid that goes around and takes care of this stuff. These guys take care of themselves. See this letter? This letter was actually written by uh, Steve's wife, Sue. I wrote one as best I could and sent it out to her. And she said, you know, George, why don't you give me a shot at that letter? And uh, she did an excellent job. Yeah. Yes. I told you I was coming right down. Yes. <laughs> I know. You're in the bar. I'm on my way. That shot's actually out of place. It's what you call crossing the line, but we left it in because it, uh, it looked good. You know, getting all these paper sounds just right is uh, always fun, but it helps build the uh, the emotion of the moment. I love this walking shot that came out of Stan's library. It's uh, the the picture is a little denigrated, which makes it all the more real for me. Two incredible children, big beautiful home, money in the bank. Steve, we have sacrificed so much over the past 10 years, and for what? We never experienced the joy of being new. This is actually Sue's voice. Not only did she write the letter, but she read the letter. So this is actually Sue Borden talking to her husband and telling him the true feelings of her heart. I wish we could give it all back and start over. I feel so distant from you. When you come home from a road trip, everyone and everything else comes first. The gym, your friends, and the kids, of course. Steve, you are an awesome father to our boys. Okay, now, you see that light hit him there? Uh, one of the cool things that we had to do was devise a way to follow him around with a light. And so we actually, this is real sophisticated, we got ourselves a, one of the flashlights from the crew, one of those mag light things. We cut out a a, a styrofoam cup, which is a great white reflector. We duct taped it together, and we had a guy that just followed Steve's face in this dark room uh, to highlight it. And uh, you know what? All that matters is that it works. Now you know the secret. So if you're just trying to do a little family video and you need to do a little highlighting of somebody's face in a dark room, just get yourself a styrofoam cup, and cut out the bottom, and Put it over a flashlight and a little duct tape, and you can't go on like you're in the big time film business. Love, Sue. Something is wrong. We got everything. She's got everything. He does this really well. He begins to show his range. Seaborn is a real actor, as well as a wrestler and a fine gentleman, but he just, he stretches here. I love this next part where he takes the, uh, the note that he had thrown away because it's from his wife who he loves. He just, it's a treasure. Even though it hurt him, it's a treasure. He smooths it out. That was for all the chicks that had to come to the movie. Okay, now Nick found me some really cool airplane sounds here. The wheels hit the ground. And you realize how important sound is in your, to make the picture work, because this is a transition piece right here that gets us into the next part of the movie. See that? Got to have those transitions that kind of take you from place to place. All right, now, see that shot right there in between the poles? We kind of worked for that, and uh, it gave us a little perspective. You're looking inside this cage, and uh, what happens in real wrestling is they lock him in there and the best man wins. And uh, these two wrestlers, Chris Harris and Lance Hoyt, uh, do a great job with Steve. These are big guys. I mean, Steve is six foot four, and these guys, I think, are six foot five or so. And uh, amazing specimen, uh, really good at their craft. And uh, 
They got me believing it, man. They started whacking him with this chair. I'm out there directing, and I'm going ouch every time he gets hit. Now, what happens here is that Steve, the bit is that Steve disappears. And they think they've got him. And then all of a sudden, we blow the smoke in. There's a guy right down there under him blowing smoke in. And these guys look up, and oh my gosh, what happened to him? He's not there. And uh, they're looking around. Yeah, what happened to him? And they turn around, and suddenly, out of the other corner, through the smoke, appears uh, Steve with his baseball bat to wield justice in the ring. Good spin there. I actually said to one of the guys after this match, you all right? And he said, oh yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and uh, looked like he had just been killed and he walked out and said, where's the craft table, man? I want a sandwich. The stages are going up tonight. These ramps will be filled with people, the Superstation and the Braves, then CNN. And now he has taken what used to okay, be- Okay, we're back at the uh, Municipal Auditorium and uh, we're finding out that Ted Turner has actually bought the league. This next section is cool because what we're trying to show you is that even tough guys have fear. And uh, 